Awesome, awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so today uh, I'm going to, as, as mentioned, give a, a, a brief presentation about uh, industrial machine learning, production-ready machine learning, uh, and more specifically on horizontally scalable data pipelines. So it may be just worth covering a bit about myself. So I am the CTO at Exponential Technologies, a chairman uh, at the Institute for Ethical Machine Learning, and a member of several uh, groups. Uh, I also lead a, a, an engineering team at a, um, a product-based B2B uh, company. And um, so today I'm going to be covering an overview of ca uh, and caveats of uh, scaling uh, data pipelines and also including machine learning pipelines, uh, covering airflow as well as its components. So this including things like Celery, um, the machine learning models and, and, and machine learning algorithms that it, uh, you, would, you would use, etc. And then introduce uh, uh, a difference of uh, two topics that often get confused uh, or mixed up as they are kind of like a spectrum and kind of between uh, part, part of each other, which is machine learning pipelines and data pipelines. And then an overview uh, of Airflow with a use case. Um, this is a very, a very broad, big picture talk, so I do recommend to actually do a deep dive on the technologies themselves. And um, we're going to be learning by example, so what better way than actually building a startup? And we're going to go full hype today. We're going to jump on the hype train, build a large-scale crypto, crypto analysis platform. Uh, we're going to do heavy compute, data analysis, transform, fetch. Uh, and we're going to go in, uh, deep uh, running predictions on LSTMs, because why not? And asking the question, putting ourselves back in uh, end of 2017, asking the question of, can we survive the crypto craze? The data set is all historical data from top 100 cryptos, and it goes all the way back from the beginning um, to um, September 2017. It is over 500,000 uh, prices. We have a, an interface that loads all of the cryptocurrencies in uh, Panda's uh, data frame, and then another that actually um, triggers the uh, distributed um, uh, predictions. The code and the slides can be found in uh, my GitHub, so please do feel free to check them out. And let's do this. So the early crypto beginnings. Uh, so the crypto ML team, you know, managed to obtain access to a unique data set, which allowed them to build their initial prototype, and that allowed them to secure VC money. Uh, it was so accurate, uh, it was insane. And now they needed to figure out what is machine learning. So just really quick, uh, they found some, some tutorials and they saw that basically it is automatic learning from data examples to predict an output based on an input. Uh, for example, telling whether a shape is a square or a triangle. Um, this is, of course, learning from some example data. More specifically, in this example, if we think about uh, a two-axis um, plot where the y-axis is the perimeter and the x-axis is the area, this could be a feature space and we would see all of our data um, you know, scattered around our, our, our feature space. And we want to learn a function in the case of classification that allows us to now divide and, and, max, and optimize for, for the division of these two, two data so that we can basically predict any new data. And this is basically using um, you know, x in the function being the input and then m and b being the weight and bias um, um, that we want to learn and that we would tweak. And then when we have the result, when we give a new input, we would be able to predict. The difference with traditional rule-based uh, programming is that we let the machine do the learning. We give it a few examples. It tries to find the best line. We give it more. It gets better more and more and more until we actually find, using a minimization uh, cost function, um, we're able to find you know, the, the, the best local op or, or global uh, optimum. In this case, you know, it's our function that we, were, that, that we would be able to use to divide the two classes and predict any new and seen inputs. Um, then the CryptoML devs ask themselves, well, can I use this uh, for my uh, time series data? And the answer is not yet, because processing sequential data requires a different approach. Um, and this is where we introduce sequential models. This is basically the models that try to predict uh, a new time step based on the examples that you've been given. Uh, it uses a similar um, you know, approach, ultimately the same basis. It just um, you know, uses the cost function a different way. Uh, the hello world of uh, sequential models is the linear, linear regression. And this is basically what we, we would use to predict our um, you know, cryptocurrency prices initially. Um, however, you know, if we use this, we would end up extrapolating and um, see that you know, Bitcoin is going to be worth billions in the next you know, two years. 
And, you know, not that people didn't do it, but, um, you know, we're not going to do it. Of course, you know, the crypto ML team wanted to go full hype. It wasn't enough, so they wanted to do to use deep neural networks, more specifically uh, recurrent neural networks. In this case, we're going to be using LSTMs. I'm not going to be diving uh, into details, as I found out a few minutes ago that my talk was only 25 minutes. So if you want to find that section of the talk, you can uh, check out one of the other videos uh, of my talks in, in YouTube. Um, well, that's great. Um, so now we know conceptually what we need to do, uh, but how do we put it in practice? And of course, the CryptoML guys found this concept of uh, machine learning pipelines. And, you know, they were copy-pasting a lot of code from Stack Overflow, but they realized that they actually needed to understand how it works and not just try to throw different amounts of data, hoping that, you know, it would uh, try to converge into, um, uh, you know, something that would be valuable. Um, so, you know, in order to do it properly, they saw that they needed to you know, uh, try to build a more mature uh, infrastructure around their machine learning. They found that uh, in a generic perspective, very, very abstract, machine learning pipelines break into two uh, different workflows. So uh, model training slash creation, so actually creating this function that I mentioned before, and then using that model to predict unseen data. Uh, the first part, the learning the function perspective, um, it breaks down into uh, finding your, basically, your training data and test data, uh, transforming this data so that it can be used and input into your machine learning uh, model that you chose, um, then actually train the, the, the model. And once you're happy with the training of this model, of course, during your iterations, um, persisting that model. And once you persist that model, then you're able to take any unseen data, I can transform it in a way that it can be represented, and then run it through your model so that you can actually obtain a prediction, um, and then get the results. It's important to mention that in the machine learning pipeline itself, um, you have these two, two steps, which are probably the most important parts in, 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 in this process, which is you know, transforming your data into features and um, you know, training the, the, the model itself. And with this, um, you, know, you need to focus a lot in, in your feature space itself. You know, that's what they found out, that they need to uh, uh, you know, find new ways in, in which you can represent the data that you're bringing in. In the example that I gave previously, squares, triangles, and shapes, this would, this would, the, the features were you know, area and perimeter. Those were the ones that we decided to represent the, the shapes as. But we can actually think of m more ways uh, and more features to get from that, such as, for example, color, number of corners, et cetera. The, the, the second thing is the, the, the actual training that the model requires. So trying to make sure that you have a representative amount of data, and not just that, but ensuring that your model is the right one for the complexity of the problem you're facing. So for example, if you have something as, you know, complex and crazy as um, you know, a, crypt, as, as, as a set of like cryptocurrency data, it may be the case, or text for example, it may be the case that the text that you're analyzing, no matter if you get a million examples, you would never be able to get the, uh, and extract, you know, the abstractions of language itself from just the text itself that you're using. And that's why you, you, would, otherwise, uh, you would sometimes benefit from other things like word to vec because it already uses things from like the entire Wikipedia to train um, this um, word vector. Um, also, uh, from the perspective of this, is you need to make sure that the, the, the data that you have is, is the right one. And that is, again, the, the relevant model and type of model for prediction. You don't want to use one that is for sequential or for classification or cl clustering in, in the wrong um, use case. And now we're uh, machine learning experts, so you can collect your certificates after the talk. Um, these certificates are valid uh, in your LinkedIn profile, um, in any non-tech meetups or parties, or in any tweets that anyone sends. You're, you're officially an expert, and you can voice your opinion in all the ways that you want. Uh, but seriously, so now it's time to build our pipeline. Uh, for linear regression, how, did the, how, how would this look like using um, you know, a simple implementation using scikit-learn? We basically take the model, um, you know, we get the transformed data, in this case the price and the, and the times. We uh, select the model that we want to use, in this case linear regression model. Uh, we then train our model from the data that we currently have, and we use uh, we choose an unseen set of data points that then we can use to actually predict for the future. In this case, we're predicting 10 uh, steps into the future using a linear function. And then now we can use it. Um, we run our linear uh, model, and then you know, we can predict the next 10 uh, time steps. In the case of the, of the recurrent neural network, very, very similar. The way that this uh, snippet does it is basically by taking a sliding window and training the recurrent network by feeding it in 50, um, um, 50 of the uh, time series data and then trying to predict the next one. 
and then moving in a sliding window to train the, the machine itself. So whenever we want to actually run the prediction, we actually just like get the first prediction and then use that next sliding window to get the next one, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and in this case, um, you know, we follow the exact same steps. So it is, again, get the data, select the model, uh, train the model, choose how many unseen data points you want, and then, you know, predict the, the, the unseen um, um, data. Um, and it, it's not too different. I mean, this is something that you would uh, tend to do um, very, very, very often. Of course, it's, it's very, very simplified. And the code to build the LSTM, you can find in the in the code base as well. I break it down a bit more uh, in, in the longer talk. And now, if, if you if you actually run it, um, you get to see that it works. Uh, when I say it works, I don't mean that you should actually take this and you know bet money for a cryptocurrency because I don't think that will work. Um, but I mean, it runs. I think that would be a more accurate perspective. Uh, and it's important to note that in this example, um, we're using the training and the prediction in the same function. As I covered previously, uh, you more often than not would, would actually separate this. You know, you would use your training, you would iterate. Once you're happy, then you would persist the model and deploy it. Um, and then run predictions in production with your, in, in your infrastructure. And the environments would be, would be completely different. And do not underestimate the, the hidden complexities. I mean, you only start um, using machine learning once you get the, the, the chosen model or even a persisted model. There is a lot of complexity all the way from, you know, staging and deploying machine learning models or, you know, storing and standardizing your repositories of, of training data, uh, test data uh, for reuse, uh, abstract, uh, abstracting the interfaces of your, of your uh, machine uh, learning pipeline to be able to say, for example, use different libraries. Um, also distributing load across infrastructure, uh, doing things like um, idle uh, resource time minimization, uh, node failure backup strategies, things like versioning of your models, how do you store um, you know, a representation of the features that you chose with like, the data that it used for training so that you can compare it, the accuracy frame. It's, it, it's, it's a lot of things that are beyond the actual uh, you know, working accurate machine learning model. And now that the, the crypto ML team, you know, have their own machine learning, deep learning pipeline, you know, they asked themselves, are we done then? And the answer is no, the fun is just getting started. Uh, they saw that, you know, um, after the crypto ML was using deep learning, uh, TechCrunch and Mashable and all of the, the above, uh, you know, wrote like a million articles. And then, you know, they were featured in, in all of them just because of the stuff that they were doing. And um, their user base exploded. Now they have like tons of users coming in every day, you know, each running several machine learning algorithms concurrently. And, you know, they try to get larger and larger single servers in AWS, but their costs were just going insane and they were just eating all of their VC money that they, they had raised. And you know, they should have really seen this coming because you know, machine learning is known but, but for being like very compute heavy, but at the same time, it's also forgotten how memory heavy it is. I mean, if you saw that Microsoft right now released like at the one terabyte um, you know, memory servers, which is you know, actually in use. Um, and then you know, it, it, it's, it's also like very hard to scale into, into large instances uh, compared to actually just um, using smaller uh, but distributed instances. And then also having to do everything in, in one node, it is a single point of failure. So it is time to go distributed. And then we introduce Celery. Uh, so who here has actually heard about Celery? Oh, amazing. I could just skip the slides. Um, both. OK, so if you guys raise the hand for the actual food. Um, Fine. Um, so um, uh, Celery basically, as, as you know, it's a distributed asynchronous task queue for Python. It's beautifully simple to use and to actually get started on a non cellarized uh, project. Um, it uses a producer-consumer architecture, so basically you have a bunch of um, producers that say this task needs to be done, and then you have a bunch of um, you know, uh, workers slash consumers that just uh, are listening continuously to this, in this case, RabbitMQ um, queue, and then take the task executed. Um, and you know, many people think that it's it's really hard. Certainly, the crypto ML devs thought it was, but it's actually not that hard uh, to get started. So in this case, we're going to take that function that we created for um, you know the prediction using the the RNN, and we're going to basically take it and just celerize it. And what happens when we celerize it? Um, we first just um, you know create the celery object uh, which connects to the to the queue to the rabbit queue. We just literally point it to the to the URL that has been exposed. Uh, we use the um, uh, the decorator app.task that basically says this task is distributed, and this task will be picked up by a worker 
that um, then is going to be listening for, for, the, for this specific type of tasks. And then once, once you have that, um, the only thing that you need to make sure is that all of your inputs and outputs, well, uh, like all of your parameters and return, um, are uh, serializable. So in this case, I'm doing a very, very basic serialization using uh, pickle dump and, and load. Um, and I'm just running it for the return and the, and the, and, and, and for the, um, the parameters to on, on, on pickle them. And then the last thing is just to run the workers. And you basically can run multiple workers very, very easily in any servers and scale it very, very, simp uh, very, very easily. And you can just see you know, the logs for, for each one of them. Um, and we're already halfway there. So now we just need to create the producer following the same receipt. So we choose the code in this case is basically just going into all of the cryptocurrency um, data frames, iterating through them, running the prediction for, uh, for each of them, um, and then basically just, again, iterating through all of them and printing it. Um, the only thing that we need to do here is um, we, we um, import that function that we just created that we already said this function is distributed. And instead of just running it in the, in the usual way, we can run it using dot delay. There are other ways that you can actually run it as well. But um, in this case, we're making sure as well that the parameters are, are being serialized. Um, once we go into the uh, re results and the printing of the results, in this case, we want to um, print them sequentially, so we do. We use the dot get, which basically waits until it finishes. Normally, you wouldn't really do this for obvious reasons. You would want to, you know, trigger the jobs to do their own thing, and then probably store the output in some database so you avoid clogging the, the you know, the the, the, the tasks that you have. And yeah, and then you just uh, run the producer. This could be many things that are creating uh, jobs um, to actually execute the queue. And uh, there are the consumers, um, you know, just listening to that. Uh, you can use other external tools like um, um, like Flower to visualize uh, all of the workers that are currently executing. And this is a very nice tool. And there are other alternatives. You can just like hit the API to see what what is currently running. And the next thing is just to run more producers and consumers. So in this case, the crypto ML team just like you know celerized their deep predict functions, and they just like you know got them running. And yes, so now we have a machine learning pipeline and we're distributed. We have surely won. Can we pack our bags? Well, not yet. This is, again, only, only not, not the beginning, but you know, it's, not, it's not the end, certainly. And that's where we jump into smart data pipelines. And you know, the, the crypto ML team now has an exponentially increasing amount of internal and external use cases. Uh, their data pipeline is getting unmanageable. You know, they also realize that machine learning, the machine learning pipeline itself is just the tip of the iceberg. They, they forgot like, that is just not the only thing that is required uh, in terms of like data ETL um, requirements that you, that you normally do in production. And you know, the growing data flow complexity, they saw that there was a growing, growing need to pull data from different sources, you know, a, a growing need to, to pre-process and post-process the data itself even beyond and, and, and before the, 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 the ML pipeline. And then as complexity increases, the actual dependency of the tasks increases as well. So if, if a task fails, then you wouldn't want to execute the, the, the next one, for example. And some of these tasks need to be cre uh, triggered chronologically. Um, the data pipelines can get very, very complex. And you know, having just celerized task run by Linux cron job gets really, really messy. Nobody wants to be there, right? So you really want to go away from here, uh, you know, literally just like a huge, messy, terrible Windows cron job, you know, file, a cron tab file to something more sophisticated that actually you can visualize it, track it, uh, debug it, et cetera, et cetera. But before jumping in, I want to actually clarify a distinction. Uh, this is basically the distinction between the terms of data pipelines and a machine learning pipeline, and providing a breakdown of definitions. Um, so this is not concrete. Uh, you know, it's a, it's kind of like a spectrum. It's a, it's a, it's you know, from my perspective, um, it is a, a machine learning pipelines are in a way a subset of data pipelines, as in the perspective that data pipelines consist of ETL workflows and running a prediction of a specific data set could be one of these ETL you know, um, you know, executions. Um, you know, in, in in a very very broad sense, what data pipelines are or consist of is you take data from somewhere, you do something with the data, and you put the results optionally somewhere else. Uh, maybe you don't put them somewhere else, but this is kind of like what it could boil down to. And it also often encompasses the concepts of scalability, monitoring, latency, um, uh, versioning, testing, uh, and a lot of like complexity that um, you know. We, we do need some tools to help us. But fortunately, many people have the same problem, uh, which is, in a way, great. 
Um, and this is where we introduce Airflow, which in, in the way that I call it is the Swiss army knife of, of data pipelines. Uh, but before I jump into what Airflow is, I want to cover what Airflow is not, because I think that is also very important. I see a lot of people trying to use Airflow in, in use cases where, you know, not they shouldn't be, but it's probably easier if they don't. Uh, Airflow, well, first, first is, is far from perfect. You know, there's a lot of data pipeline frameworks that you can use, which I'm going to cover. Um, Airflow is not perfect, but it is definitely the best one out there. Um, this is kind of like from, from, the, from, the, from the research that, that, that I have done and, and choosing the, the, the frameworks. It's also not a Lambda function as a service framework, uh, although it could be programmed as. Um, it's not a machine learning pipeline, so you're not, um, you know, you know, it's not going to be providing you everything you need to, to you know, version and deploy and uh, uh, your, 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 your models and, you know, run 10 different types of, like, parameters and see which give you the best accuracy. You could do it, but, you know, it's... It's only one of the use cases that you would use it for. There are other tools that you could use that are more specific. Uh, it's not extremely mature. It's in Apache incubation, so you need to be aware of that. And they're going through a big revamp. Um, and with this big revamp, you need to make sure that whatever you build in, uh, and deploy in production with Airflow, you can migrate it. Um, and that's one of the beautiful things about Airflow that is very modular. Um, it's also not a data streaming solution. So, um, uh, However, you could still augment it with some sort of like external you know, data streaming or even HDFS based um, solution like Spark. You know, they often ask us like, why do you use you know, Airflow instead of Spark? You would never use Airflow instead of Spark. You would use your, you'd leave your Spark there and then you know, your Airflow may trigger some stuff there. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's not, one is not the other uh, and cannot replace. Well, maybe could replace it, but it would, yeah. Maybe we, we, we can have an, a discussion in the pub about that. Um, so let, let, let's now dive deep into, into Airflow. Uh, Airflow, in, in brief, is basically a data pipeline framework written in Python uh, with an active community and a UI for management. Uh, the Air, Air, Airflow's course is, is our DAGs, which is directed as cyclic graphs. And these are basically ETL operations uh, that are executed in a specific order um, that only execute if the previous one succeeded. Um, the, the DAGs are defined programmatically, so basically you specify the name of the DAG, the start date, and the schedule, which is basically on, on cron uh, format, and then you define the ETL operations um, in, in potentially Python or whatever, uh, and then you define the, the order in which they're executed. So in this case of a, just like a very simple graph, you can define it like that, so operator one after operator two. Uh, then you can actually see all of the uh, DAGs that you've defined in your list overview. Uh, together with all of the, um, you know, uh, information of executions, which ones failed, which ones are currently being executed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This views Airflow is not really the most beautiful design, but it's very functional. Um, you can also have a detailed DAG view here. You can see like a, uh, a specific DAG in in more detail with all of the operations that you are that you have, together with all of the uh, executions. Um, in this case, you know, on on, on each date. Uh, this is probably like a every day it got executed once, and you can see that it succeeded. Um, and then, you know, operators are very easy to define. Uh, in, in this case, we're defining, you know, a crypto prediction, uh, where you, you know, get the data, run the prediction, store it, uh, and we're using a Python operator specifically to just say, like, just wrap this uh, Python function and run it uh, whenever, um, you know, it, it's its turn, right? So you, when you define your DAG, it can be like, it runs the, the fetch of the data, and then it runs the, the actual prediction. And then it might run some other operator that puts it back into somewhere other system or sends an email. Um, then also, Airflow provi provides default operators. One of them are, for example, sensor operator, which basically, when triggered, it, um, it's, it pulls as, uh, as many times as until it returns true, for example, or false. And you can set the time that it you know, waits between each time it pulls. Um, then you can actually also pass data downstream in your, in your DAGs. So for example, whenever you run something in an operator, you can return, and then whatever you return, you can actually retrieve it. And this is very useful for storing things like, you know, triggering DAGs that need to hold a specific ID or pass specific other IDs. It's also worth mentioning that Airflow has a database. It uses uh, Postgres. Um, However, well, it can, it can use any SQL-based uh, database. However, you shouldn't pass really massive things downstream because it, it, it inserts it into the database and then you retrieve it back again, so it's not very efficient. Uh, you normally would just pass some, some simple things like IDs or some, something like that. Uh, in this case, what we're doing is, you know, we're creating a push function and then a pull function. The push just basically returns a list, 
and the pool uses the XCOM objects, as they're called, to basically retrieve it, whatever data was passed from upstream. And then we just define those two operators, and we say push tasks goes before pull task. Um, you can also visualize the uh, execution of the parameters. Same, uh, uh, you can also visualize the logs, a lot of the things you could actually do in the UI. And the cool thing about Airflow is that it's very modular, uh, which is um, you know, it's great because you can separate the definition of your operators with the definition of the DAGs themselves. And you also have things like sub-DAGs um, that you, know, you can reuse this, this cycle, uh, acyclic graphs that you've defined. Uh, and it's also very extensible. You can create your own operators, hooks, executors, et cetera. And if that is not awesome enough, you can actually use different backends to run this on. Um, Celery is the one that currently is most common, but you know, I assume that you can also use things like Kubernetes, um, using the, the um, native Kubernetes um, communication to send the tasks, et cetera. And then for CryptoML, what they wanted to do is they wanted to pull some crypto data every day, data is transformed and standardized, when ready, they want to trigger a prediction for each cryptocurrency. Uh, and then if, if, if um, they want to store that prediction in the database, and then based on some rules, they want to you know, trigger a trade. Uh, so if we break this down into Airflow terminology, first for each individual cryptocurrency update, we would uh, have an operator that transforms the data, then another one that sends the data into uh, the, the crypto engine. Then we trigger a sensor that pulls the engine until it's done. Once it's done, we basically uh, branch off uh, where one of the operators uh, stores the data and the other one, um, based on some rules, it would trigger a trade. And now for all of the crypto jobs, we would have basically some um, um, schedule job that would run, say, every day. It would pull, for example, 20 data, set, uh, data sets of cryptocurrency, and for each one of them, it would trigger um, a sub DAG, uh, in this case, a DAG. Again, so, Airflow is not very mature. The way that you actually trigger dynamic um, DAGs, you would, you would have to do it with the session API, which is not, not great. Um, so this is kind of like the summary, same thing that I just said, the operator, sensors, and branch. Success, so now we basically, uh, uh, you know, crypto guys managed to, to um, set up their pipelines. Uh, do check out the, the Apache Airflow um, project. Uh, I would recommend you to get started to just read the documentation. Um, and there are some alternatives like Luigi, Pimble, Seldon Core, and other similar ones that are not really similar. It would be used in completely different use cases like Dask or Apache Kafka. And then some special mentions like Docker and Kubernetes, which you can find implementations in the code base. And cryptocurrency guys managed to sort it out. They survived. They're probably millionaires now living in their own island. But for us, you know, we got our overview on data pipelines, the difference between machine learning pipeline and data pipelines, overviews and use case. Um, again, code is in the repo, so please do feel free to check it out. And with that said, feel free to contact me, and thank you very much. I hope that was informative.